Welcome to the 33rd episode of Downtime Podcast and the first episode of 2018. So my name is Elisa. I'm Jeremy. And welcome for making it this far. We said we were going to do it big in 2018 and we're actually sitting with us right now. Um, He is an award-winning story supervisor, storyboard artist, writer, director, in 2015, he co-directed Pixar's film Inside Out. He's also a comic book artist for Paper Biscuit. Um, is there anything that, that he hasn't done yet? <laughs> <laughs> so here in front of us is Pixar's Ronnie Del Carmen. So welcome to the podcast. Hello. Woo. Thank you for having me. Uh, happy to be here. Yes. and so, What are we doing? <laughs> And happy New Year! How was your New Year's? Oh, uh, my New Year's is always um, um, good <laughs> because I'm a little conflicted about New Year's. Oh, uh, okay. Yes, because my birthday is on December 31. Oh, happy belated so, birthday! Happy belated yes, birthday! Yes, exactly. <laughs> it should be, and everyone tells me. <laughs> and if I had a dollar, everyone always tells me that. Oh, wait, so you have the most fun birthday because <laughs> there's fireworks and everybody in the entire world is celebrating your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, since I was seven years old, my birthday is uh, is kind of like an afterthought eventually. Ah, it's like when you're right. little, it's like, happy birthday, happy birthday. But then le- later on, it'll be like, happy new year. Oh, and, oh yeah. Oh, and, <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks. But... You know, I'm I'm over it. I'm not bitter. <laughs> not bitter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's like similar if you were like for people born around Christmas too. Yes, yes. I know. <laughs> it's, it's not quite a, the best deal around, but you know, <laughs> you make the best of it. To start off the podcast, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and where you came from and how you came to the United States. Mm, okay, so I, I grew up in the Philippines. I was born there. I was born in a small town uh, called Cavite City. It's uh, right across the bay from Manila, actually. <laughs> and in, in Cavite City, there it was a U.S. naval base there, Sangley Point. And in Sangley Point, walled off from me is, is the U.S. <laughs> 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 you know, battleships and airstrip and all that. But outside is the town I grew up in. And... Um, I've always loved watching cartoons, and I loved American culture. I would watch TV constantly, incessantly, <laughs> and I would ape all of the things that that uh, these people in the box would do, but mostly American programming. I just was obsessed with it, and uh, but I didn't think that I was going to be a, an animator. I didn't even know what that means. I don't know how cartoons are made. I don't want to know. <laughs> I just want to watch them yeah, yeah. over and over again. And then um, it, it made me want to draw, and I did. I, I like reading and drawing, so I drew constantly. And then I, and my dad actually got worried because I wasn't paying attention to my schoolwork. Uh. My math scores were terrible. My handwriting was atrocious. All the kind of things that my dad excelled in. You know, that his, his math skills were awesome and he has great penmanship. It's kind of like Declaration of Independence kind of handwriting. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I could never, I still, to this day, will never be able to actually top that. And then um, uh, we had some hard times and I couldn't go to school, but then eventually kind of, I, I managed to get into a vocational two-year course of, uh, of um, uh, drawing, which is, is, which is advertising production. Which is being a commercial artist. That means you make signs, you do ads, and stuff mm. like that. It's a start. <laughs> yes. It, 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 it beats all the other kinds of jobs and, and careers that I could have chosen. There were a number of false starts. But being able to draw seems to be something that I could make some money off of. Why not? And then I eventually graduated to become an art director in an advertising agency. Um, and then... My father by then had migrated to the U.S. as a long shot. And then the petition for me to come to the U.S. comes in. And I migrated here to the U.S. down in Los Angeles in July 1989. Okay. Yeah. So you stayed in Los Angeles first? Stayed in Los Angeles first for, for about 10 years and worked in various studios there before coming here to Pixar. Got it. And what inspired you to decide to drive up and 
try it out in the Bay Area. I don't know. I mean, I was doing pretty good, I thought. I mean, I worked on Batman, the animated series, uh, and I, I worked for DreamWorks. And I was, by then, by the time that I was having a crisis of, of creative uh, journeys, I was already ahead of story several times over at uh, DreamWorks. And then I went to the Burbank Media Center. And by then, I've already seen Toy Story 1. And Toy Story 2 was playing oh, okay. at the Media Center in Burbank. And I sat there, and I think it was an afternoon showing, and I sat in the front, front row seats. <laughs> and I looked up, and I watched this movie. And I loved it, but I was full of despair. <laughs> Because all I could think of was like, I am never going to be part of something as glorious as this. It was magnificent. And by then, I'm, I'm making movies already in the studio. I'm helping make movies already right, in right. the story capacity. But I still feel like I'm never going to come close to anything like this. Um, so when one of uh, my friends, Ted Mathot, who works here, who had started here on, on working on Monsters, Inc., had been telling me, why don't you come up here and you know, apply? And it's like, I don't know if they'll want me. And it's like, well, I've been showing your drawings around. I think they're interested. So I did. I applied. So in, in, in 2000, they accepted me. And I started on Finding Nemo. And the rest is history. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 that was that was a stroke of luck. I actually, when they interviewed me, uh, um, back then we were so were so small. I was in Point Richmond, and the interview process, I had, it was the most unconventional interview process. So you walk in, you walk past the reception, you get the same sticker that you guys yeah. get, yeah. a stranger from the outside. Yes. <laughs> and then I, I sit in one room, and then one by one, people come in to look at me. I, I met everybody there, short oh. of Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Walking between two, Frogtown and Bugville, these two buildings across, <laughs> you know, that, that's partitioned by a... By, Great names, by the way. <laughs> yes, they are. Partitioned by a, 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 the railway. It just felt like a Hollywood musical. People were just I'm just walking past and look out. Oh, there's John. Oh, there's Ed. Hi. It's like hey, he's applying. Oh, hello. And <laughs> I sit in another room, and the art directors come by, and everyone like peers in. They, they peer in and kind of look. Are you him? <laughs> <laughs> who, 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 who him? <laughs> and all around me were all these images of monsters. They're making a movie about monsters. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then I show up for my first day of work because they accepted uh, me and, and, and to work. And then I sit around in a room and it's like, hmm, this room is full of drawings of fishes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on? Oh, you're working on a movie about fishes. I am. I thought I was working on a movie about monsters. <laughs> <laughs> but lucky for me, actually, is that that was, that was quite uh, an adventure working with Andrew and Eventually, I got to work with Pete anyway. <laughs> right, right. From a storyboard artist, how did you build your way up to storyboard, a story supervisor, and then eventually starting directing for Doug's special mission? Yeah, that's, that's kind of an unusual path because uh, as a story, there are different types. Because if you storyboard for TV, the, the, the process is a little different. The scripts are, are, are written already, and they're handed to you, and you essentially delineate what's on the script. You can't veer away from it. Um, in animated features, the, the story is actually being figured out by the story department as well as a number of writers that are hired to actually flesh the story and the characters out. But we prove our story in story reels by making animatics of them. And then we change our minds every day, all the time. <laughs> we try and make these characters come alive as if you know, you were watching a movie already, and it's not as easy as somebody writes it, somebody draws it, and somebody animates it. That's what the feature storyboarding gig is. And when I started in feature animation storyboarding, I did not know how to do that. I only knew the TV version. I can draw you anything. You give me the script pages, I'll draw it for you. <laughs> I'll draw it really well, or you can publish the darn drawings if you wanted to. <laughs> I will not be ashamed. But 
what I discovered was that it, it is the, the process of iteration, doing things over and over again, trying out many things, which one is good, which one's the best, and you keep the best ones, and, and then you weed away the things that don't work. But it's constantly working and reworking and reworking things. I had to learn that process. But the other part of being an animation feature, animation story artist, is that you're part writer, you're part director, and you're all storyteller. You have to take charge of what's given to you. You can't just go and do as you're told, even though there's parts of that mission that is like that. They kind of encourage you, kind of like bring that storytelling part of you into the game. By the time I understood that, uh, I felt like I really like this job. This is fun because I'm at par with not only the directors and the writers, but they actually encourage you to, to participate in that way. So with that, um, I got offered, after my first story person gig, I got offered head of story on uh, Road to El Dorado. And then uh, my story actually, in terms of being um, uh, promoted to anything, is like every time that somebody asks me, it's like, we want you to do this job, my answer is always, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Because I they're promoting me to a job that I've never done before. So I get to say that um you know you're probably are looking for a person who's over somewhere else but I have no experience with it. And they says like no really we think that you'll be fine. It's like okay, well you only have yourself to blame. <laughs> <laughs> so all the time everyone offers me these gigs wherein I'm not the best representation of what my skills are but people tend to see something and want me to actually take that shot and i've been it's been consistent for me that people nominate me to do things that i myself can't see but thankfully someone actually does <laughs> um going back to doug's special mission up is actually my favorite pixar movie of all Thank time you. It's, <laughs> it, it has a very dear part of my heart as well yeah um and when i found out that you directed that, that short I was mm -hmm. very I was really enthusiastic to add all these questions for you but I kind of wanted to narrow it down to um, how hard was it writing for Doug as a character not by then it wasn't hard to, to write for Doug and because I still have around me you know I had Bob Peterson uh, right. as, as a, someone who can help me because he's the voice of Doug yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's right and down on that we've worked on, on the character so we kind of know him and uh, so it was comfortable to actually write Doug's special mission but I also wanted to find out what happened to Doug before we met him. I was curious. And because as a storyteller, you start telling stories to yourselves about, you don't want your characters to show up on screen as if they have no history. Mm -hmm. So when I deal with characters, I deal with characters who happen to have a history. We don't even have to show it on screen, but I believe they have this history. So I had the opportunity to actually flesh out Doug's history according to how I see him. And I also, uh, maybe this is going full circle, I also feel like because my birthday, nobody knows my, when my birthday is. <laughs> no one it's, knows about New Year's Eve. Nobody knows. <laughs> Even in the company uh, greetings, we have a, everybody gets greeted, happy birthday on the email. I'm not on that list. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't put my name on that list. <laughs> because that's how I want it, right? Yeah. But... For Doug, I wanted him to be that innocent, um, childlike character who wants to tell people that, you know, today's a special day. It's it's my birthday. He's always very earnest. Yeah. You yes. know? And But you don't get to find out what that is until later, right? Uh, yeah. In terms of kind of like, uh, well, you, you do get to understand he's been trying to tell people that it's today is my birthday, but nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. Right, but what we don't know is that he had a secret wish because we always believe that Doug is not the most favored member of the pack, and not only that, months actually doesn't value him because he's not a hunter, he's not a soldier. I actually imagine that Doug's actual earlier history is that during a time when the months expedition was being prepared and crewed up and loaded into the dirigibles when he was younger to go to. South America. <laughs> Doug was a dog somewhere in a town next to the airport where they were going to wow. go and take off. 
and that he had accidentally wandered in there onto the conveyor belts and then the 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 the, the, oh. the boxes that were being lifted in there. And you can imagine that Doug is going to. I am I am going up. <laughs> <laughs> it is dark here. <laughs> Look, there are clouds, birds. And he doesn't know that he's on a trip. He was an inadvertent stowaway that landed up and then, and then became part of the pack. I'd love to see that short. I know. I, know. <laughs> I, I like that story too. But that's my idea. Of it. I don't know if that's going to no, be part it's of it. brilliant. The... It fits right in. <laughs> no, but that's the stories we tell ourselves when we're making up. And of course. We, so that, because it, that we wanted to explain why the golden retriever, amongst all of these kind of soldier-like dogs, is there. He's, he's kind of cast wrong. Mm-hmm. He so, stands out a lot. Yes, yeah. yes. And he doesn't have that kind of personality. Why would Muntz personally choose him? Right. And it's because he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the fun part of storytelling. Because like, say, for example, you just have a random stick figure and you have a drawing of a house and a lake. And then someone mm-hmm. gives you that picture and tells you, okay, you have to make something out of this. Yeah. Make this character something. Yeah. And I think that's very fun but i also think it's really cool that doug in the short is a, a bit of a reflection of you as well yeah yes we we tend to do this a lot in in the way that we make movies it's kind of interesting and humbling at the same time and pete and i talk about it all the time we want to make a movie about an old man who floats his house full of balloons um but in the end while we're making it the three of us pete dr bob peterson myself a lot of us is in the movie. Our own kind of personal stories kind of seep in. We don't intend it. I mean, we were trying not to. Nobody wants, no matter who you meet, none of us want to tell each other our own story, really. I mean, it's like, no, no, I, that's a point of vulnerability you don't need in your life, right? But because what we do is we tell stories, part of not only our world, our history, and what we care about at the moment, starts showing up not by any intention so there's large parts of of myself bob and pete and 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 us and in all the movies that we make no i love i love how organic it is and how how humanistic it is it really shows in the characters and i I absolutely love that oh yes thank you when we were young all of us we want to find our faces on the screen our stories out there in books and movies and whatever what have you <laughs> there's not a lot and then when you happen on to artists or performers that are kind of like you you kind of light up a little bit and you feel like well there's a path that i think i can use as an inspiration point so us working in the industry we feel like you know we could supply that same kind of guidance and kind of inspiration point to our younger people who want to do similar things oh yeah i know that's why we did this podcast as well as being filipino americans we want to talk about we want to like talk about what we like and to put that on the internet as kind of like our platform of showing the world what our thoughts and ideas are for like media in general yeah yeah that's really great cool. when you started off like i guess like what's important to me too when I grew up was a lot of mentorship mm-hmm. and figuring out my path. Yeah. And when you first came on here, was it kind of difficult getting that sort of mentorship and finding, you know, finding that community at first to help guide you in this industry? Um, it actually wasn't hard. I was very lucky. People were very ready to give me a hand and give me indications of where to look or what to improve on. I I had um, many people who kind of nominate me to explore things or become something that I felt with my insecurity feeling like, I don't think that's for me. No, go ahead and do it. So most of the time um, when people know that you're, either your work ethic or the work that you do is good, and that it's a valuable uh, part of the work that they're doing. I think that you can't help but kind of extend that gracious hand to help other people because I know that's how I am when I work with people who who are 
really trying hard to help you and also don't have that attitude that says i'm pretty good and i'm just helping you because i'm the best no they nobody has that that attitude here and they all just want to be of service to lend their talent to what is this movie that they're making and it's hard to find people who want to help you in that way that's genuine and then also who happen to be very strong at at the at their craft and I think that I've been a good kind of collaboration partner and 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 um someone to go on long journeys with <laughs> right <laughs> not that any of those journeys are going to be easy because they're all complicated and you also end up actually having conflict in the relationship mm-hmm. but once you start believing in other people then you kind of move them along with you or move them up yourself it's it's a great aspect of human nature to feel that if you are not threatened you will help i remember back in college one of my friends cuz you, you know how sometimes college can get very competitive mm-hmm. in classes and one of my classmates uh we created this study group and everyone was just trying to help each other and we had this one kid in the group who was definitely had better grades than most of us and but he was very willing to just make sure that we all understood that he didn't want to be like the highest grade in the class and he was saying i it's better i think if we all succeed together yeah. yes that's kind of the culture of the work that i experience here particularly at pixar is that in order to cross the finish line four or five years down the line um the hope of the leadership of the movie us there close to the beginning of it we want to bring in people who we want to finish this journey with if we start we want to cross the finish line the same um in general that works really well you know because this path that we chose to make movies even though it's fun when you watch it on the screen for an hour and a half is you laugh you cry you have a great time making animated features is not easy and is particularly not easy on your emotions on your psyche uh, on your stress level even though we're making cartoons there's a lot at stake personally there's a lot at stake you know for the studio and it's uh, there's a lot to that's 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 kind of weighing on on every kind of creative choice and the only thing that actually will matter in your day is if people believe in you is if you even in, like there are days when you kind of like have loggerheads and you kind of argue and you feel like I don't like that person I don't want to talk to that person yeah <laughs> but in spite of those kind because human beings right but in spite of that you still would say it's like would you be on a lifeboat with these people and it's just like yeah I would I love it speaking of emotional animated movies inside out how did you come to co-direct inside out that is also one of those mysterious things because i was the head of story on 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 up and i had a great time i was thinking that if pete makes another movie i will help him in whatever way it is in one of the tables downstairs and in lunch time with jonas uh, rivera um after um we've done the uh, publicity tours uh for for up Pete uh, sat down with me and I was already helping him with whatever little missions I could help him with. Uh, by, by then I was also already working on Wally, the first two acts of it, but I wasn't going to be a permanent player there. I was always going to try and help Pete out. So Pete approaches me and then sits down and is like, "So, we want to have something to tell you. Uh, I would like to offer you the co-director on Inside Out." I says like, "Yes." <laughs> 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 wow. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, what Pete was offering me that I didn't understand was not the title it was a, an opportunity to continue the journey that we started and up and find out even more what we else can we make and i had to learn a lot about myself in that journey in terms of what my limitations are and how i can further my education 
uh, and then also being in partnership with Pete, it, it, to me, in aggregate, it deepened my understanding of why we're friends, why we ma make a certain kind of movie together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's only tested through trial, pressure, <laughs> crises. And then at the end of that, when you're standing in a screening of that movie, and, all, and you're still kind of remembering all the meetings and all the difficulties of it, and, and all you're thinking is like, boy, this movie's pretty good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the reward of, of, of that. So. Inside Out is uh, one of my favorite Pixar movies, and yeah. I think what... What I enjoy about it, and it wraps up a lot of what we've talked about, is the relatability of that movie and how it's about human emotions, how one time you're feeling happy and sad, and mm. sometimes parents can't really connect with their kids and kids can't yes. connect with their parents. Yes. And imaginary friends, too. Um, but also, my question is, how important was it to create a movie that anyone at any age can relate to and what and i guess what were some of a few of the steps to making sure that it was a credible movie in that degree well this is all pete doctor his creativity his it comes from his curiosity he wonders what if or why is that and he wants to see that and actually, he wanted to do this movie because he observed his daughter actually changing mm -hmm. from being that bubbly little girl who says, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And then one day, mm, puberty hits. Yeah. <laughs> do not want to talk about anything or talk to you, closes the door, and, yeah. and you, nobody, uh, your, your daddy is no longer at the center of her universe. By then, my daughter and I already had gone through that already because my kids are older and my daughter used to babysit um, Pete's kids mm -hmm. so I told Pete that you know I kind of know what happens from here on so I can tell you this horror story that's coming <laughs> <laughs> and um, so between he and I and, and all of our creative partners we started talking about all our childhoods and then the children that we have if we have them we pour those into the movie also our observations of other of the people who were making it. So what you can relate to come from other human beings' stories. So you can almost guarantee that someone will also feel the same way. We don't make these things just to make them fantastic, you know, or or make them huge fantasies that you've never seen before. But the characters' journeys are essentially our personal journeys as well. So earlier on, early on, we decided that Joy's journey was the journey of a parent. But it's going to be why is it a movie? Is because we're going to make Joy the parent who has an extra kind of uh, challenge. She's a parent that the child is not even aware of. Those two will never meet. There will be never a time wherein Riley will hear Joy or see her. It's kind of heartbreaking, right? You love this little girl so much that you, but you can't. You, she will never know you exist. And the the one scene that we made that I I wanted in the movie, and then we explored it early, is to, when all of the emotions go to bed. Joy plays a favorite memory of of Riley as a little girl skating on the ice. And all Joy wants to do is kind of move along with the memory as if she was there beside the little girl. That's the closest that she could have. And that's that's why those scenes are there. It's beautiful. Yeah, really <laughs> now is. I have to rewatch Inside Out. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite thing about directing this film specifically? Well, besides the partnership with Pete, because you know, I know that that he will in 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 the entire journey that he will come to me for some solutions and um and then I'll go away and try and solve it for him so it's it's mostly the journey with the people making it is, is the, it's it's the biggest kind of thrill of it uh the movie itself being received well by human beings in the dark <laughs> 
<laughs> when you go into a theater, I watch the people. Everyone's just crying. I, I, turn, <laughs> I turn and watch the audience, and when they get emotional, because human beings' faces are the the, the it's it's our tell. No matter how hard it is for you to try and keep it down, you're one. So when I watch human beings' faces in the dark watching the movie, their faces change. And then once they get, and even if I'm watching the back of someone's head, their their posture changes. And then after a moment, uh, silence. We even we even put some silence in the movie just so that people can have a little moment. And then you see the hand come up and wipe out a tear that's on the cheek, and then continue watching the movie. And I feel like. You know, as hard as the movie was to make and heartbreaking, that is worth it. To know that people started to relate to these characters. Absolutely. I think that's the goal of any filmmaker, I think. (laughs) Um, So we're going to move on to the last bit of our podcast. Um, I just had a really quick question. Have you ever read your Wikipedia page? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course. I think that's at, at that point. I think you know you've made it. You're like you're famous at that point. Well, I don't know. <laughs> you can edit that and, what, and make it say whatever you want to. Yeah. It's like, oh gosh, how accurate is it? Uh, I don't know which part. Would, <laughs> I think so. They're it's a fairly short entry, isn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Didn't go into too much detail. Yeah. Okay. I was yeah. just curious if you. Yeah, were. yeah. <laughs> it's not like I'm. That did not happen at all. <laughs> <laughs> They didn't talk about my time when I was running a small country <laughs> and being king. <laughs> no. no. Everything okay. there is pretty much what you got. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, do you play video games at all? Yes, I do. Oh, really? What are yeah. you playing right now? Well, I just downloaded uh, Hellblade. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I nice. um, started that, and it's fantastic. I grew up uh, with my kids playing video games with my kids. I was I was one of those parents who enabled this to happen, but only on weekends. <laughs> ah, yes, only on yes. weekends. So uh, the very first uh, consoles that show up in the house, uh, dad has rules so that they can only play it on like Friday as they come back from school and then Saturday and that's it. And then they complain, but daddy, you're going to play... <laughs> Yes, because it's daddy's house. <laughs> daddy, you stay up late past bedtime. Yes, because daddy makes the rules. <laughs> Daddy's going to stay up late and be groggy the next day at work and be useless because I'm having to finish this boss. <laughs> it's terrible. So, yes, I do, I do play a lot of video games. So, we, we, I got to love a lot. <laughs> what console did you start off with? We started out with with, uh, with a PlayStation a long time ago, and then eventually nice. an Xbox showed up and you know, all that. Um, so um, one of the very first video games that uh, I remember playing was a, the Tomb Raider 2. <gasps> wow. Oh, I, my God. We <laughs> and then <laughs> there's Resident <laughs> Evil 2. Oh, back then. Nice. It was very yeah. blocky back then. Oh, yeah. Uh, my son and I like horror games, so Nightmare Creatures was was one of those. And then uh, we, event, my daughter would play Spyro and Crash Bandicoot. So okay. I would have nice. my son would like these kind of more fighting games. Like Final Fantasy VII was a big ruler oh. of the house, right? Nice. And every iteration of Final Fantasy. And then, um, but the kids would always tell me, "It's like, Dad, you gotta watch me when I play." So I, when they <laughs> when they play, I watch. Even to this day, as grown-ups, when they come home and they play, they set aside a space on the couch for me to sit in so that I can just watch them play. And they're Aww. big people now. My son's <laughs> 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> were, yeah. there, were there a lot of fights over who played their game or like sometimes who had the there's controller? just like sibling kind of skirmishes they are they're, then there's the battle of which group of friends get to rule the living room wow. uh but there's some <laughs> games yes like fatal frame kind of unites oh, nice. everybody in the dark and i <laughs> turn off all the lights in the living room yes. Dad, <laughs> perfect Dad, what are you doing i turn off and then they all scream and I can hear him in, in our bedroom. My wife's just like, here we go. <laughs> They're all screaming. Uh, I played Dead Space too much. I um, loved uh, the Uncharted games. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, 
The Journey is an amazing movie. So is Eco. It's one of my favorite. Mm-hmm. One of those things. No, I'm, I, I love those things. Wish I could make one. <laughs> <laughs> Are you playing the, um, the Resident Evil that came out last year? My son started playing it. So it's one of those. Again, he's on the couch and I'm in there sitting there. It's like, man, this thing is uh, mm, terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> Where's Umbrella, for God's sake? <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. What is your favorite food spot in the Bay Area? Uh, I don't... I, I I have, like, a few. We like a, a, a lot of, of uh, restaurants here on, on, on Grand. We like uh, Boot and Shoe, uh, the ramen shop here on Rock Ridge. Um, and then in the city, it's the Tadich Grill. If I have people Isn't who come on- in... Haven't we seen that before? Yeah, we passed by. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people come in. And say, I've never been to San Francisco before. I was just like, go to the Tadish Grill. There's no reservations, mm-hmm. and um, you sit there for about 20 minutes waiting for, for them, or 30 minutes for, to call your name. You sit there. I promise you, you'll love it. It's classical nice. San Francisco restaurant. Even the, all the waiters are like characters. The space is wonderful. So. Love, wow. love that. I never even knew that. I should be ashamed. I live in SF. <laughs> I yeah. need to go. I know. That, that, that's awesome. Well, there's also the Swan's Oyster mm-hmm. uh, Depot. There's also another one of those two, three-hour lines. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <yeah, yeah. laughs> you can sit there and have fresh seafood. Right, right. Those are fantastic. There's a, there's a bunch, man. If you go down, uh, like, in the Mission, there'll be so much to, to go oh, to. Mission is great. Yes. Oh, so. Beautiful. When was the last time you went to the Philippines? Uh, a couple of years ago, I went home. I like going home for two reasons. One, there's family there. Um, and then um, the other is going to a white sandy beach in, in Palawan. That is the best. Oh. I remember when I emailed you, well, one of the first things you asked me was, have you been to Palawan? Because, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And the answer is no, I haven't <laughs> been there yet. Yes. And I've, I've been to a number of beaches, not a big beach kind of goer, but uh, Palawan, specifically Coron, it's really magical. And, and I don't want it to be overly developed, but it's this really white, powdery sand. There's nobody around. And you're thinking, it's like, I'm going to put on and snorkel and look for colorful fishes. You wade in That's up awesome. to your knees. Yeah. And it's warm waters, right? Especially go go late, like like late February, before the tourists show up. And all I do is like put on a the snor the snorkel gear, and then I just bend my knees to sink my head past the water line. And oh look, fishes, <laughs> they're right there, oh, that's teeming. Awesome. That's beautiful. It's like oh, well, no. I thought I was gonna go swim out and go look for them. They're, they're it's right, right there. there. Wow. <laughs> they're not afraid of people. They're just so and it's very relaxing and it's home uh when i'm in the philippines i'm like everybody else right so nobody thinks of me twice you know and i still speak the language so i pretty much i blend in are you tagalog yes very much so Uh, that's my only that's my only dialect Actually, uh, my grandfather is from Cavite. Oh, really? And he, went, he joined the Navy in the naval base there. Yes. Yeah. In Sangley Point. Yeah. That's and how you get in. Yeah. And I also read that you went to UST, and my grandmother on the same side went to UST as well and studied zoology. My aunt went to <laughs> UST, yes, also. Oh, my God. Does everybody come from there? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cliche. <laughs> When I found out about that you were from Cavite, I was really excited. Yeah. <laughs> really All cool. three brothers are in animation. Oh, yeah. wow. There's oh, three wow. of us. Oh, wow. Yes. Louis just joined Disney a couple of months back. He was uh, at a different studios before. He's, a, he's in the story department there. He's my youngest brother. My The middle brother, Rick, is, is working on Family Guy for the last 10, 12 years. Oh, okay. You know, mm-hmm. none of us working had animation training background. We yeah. didn't go to school for it. We fell into it. That's that's amazing. I feel I so natural. <laughs> I know. Should we expect a future story about Filipino culture or growing up? Oh, I hope so. But, you know, it's the movie business. You never know. It's true. Anything's possible. Anything's, Anything's possible. possible. Yeah. I've, I've had a good run of being part of many movies. And yeah. Parts of me are in there. Maybe someday there that could happen. If it's not me, somebody will do it. Yeah. No. 
Um, with that, there's a question here that I think okay. Elisa really wants to ask. I need to ask this because my dad was asking me this <laughs> and he was like, you should ask, you should ask Ronnie that. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll ask it. So, um, you worked on Finding Nemo. Yes. Okay. So the dentist's name in Finding Nemo is it's P. Sherman. Is P. Sherman. <laughs> yes. Is that? A play on a P. Play Sherman. On, yes. I don't know. Oh. I wish I could. I wish I could uh. tell you. But the thing about it is that it sounds real. It yes, sounds absolutely <laughs> right. Because that's how what my uncles and aunts would actually say fisherman. Same. Yes. Fisherman. <laughs> that that's what that's what that is. But uh, I wouldn't. I I. It's probably very true. But because I was not in the room when that got decided. Because uh, a lot of the times I will be in the room when certain things like that get decided. It could have been decided in the art department mm -hmm. where Ricky Nervo mm -hmm. is, who's Filipina, right? And then there's Nelson Buhol, who's also in the art department. They may have been musing that out loud there, and they may be responsible for it. But for <laughs> me, it's like I get to name characters here and there. I name Squirt, uh, the little <laughs> turtle, the, you know. Awesome. And, yes. <laughs> but oh, only awesome. because I told uh, that Andrew was kind of musing, kind of like, what's the name of the kid, whatever. I was like, how about Squirt? Go, oh, go, good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a temp name. We'll change it later. It didn't it change. It didn't change. It's stuck. <laughs> it's stuck in it. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but that one, I wish I could tell you definitively that I was in a room when that came up. <laughs> okay. okay, I wasn't, but I'm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, move it past that. That somebody here at Pixar did that for that reason. <laughs> So the mystery goes on. The I mystery guess. goes on. <laughs> yeah, you have, you have to nail her. exactly the person who does it. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Um, I think we have time for one more yes. question. If you want to ask the last one. All right. So. What advice do you have for people who just kind of want to create and tell stories for people who, you know, ha may have writer's blocks and just like they have something to say, but like it just it isn't coming out yet? Oh, well, I think that a lot of younger people, and I know I was like this too, I want to have something to say, but I have nothing to say. There's a lot of clever things you want to do. But clever doesn't really do it, mm -hmm. you know? Or even just a lot of muscle flexing of what you're really good at. Yeah. Most uh, younger people, and again, I was like this, I just want to be hired to do something or be told that now I can do it. So it's like you're waiting for permission to be able to do something, but you actually don't need it, right? You can keep making and writing and creating without anyone having to bless you past that gate. But the one thing that actually uh, helps anybody on anything is that if you make something, make sure that you finish it. Don't muse part of it mm -hmm. and then kind of leave it alone and feel that, well, I have this opus that I'm working on 20 years later, it's still not done, and nobody's seen it. If you do make something, and you do finish it, if you show it to people, you will get feedback. Feedback is what we do here in the studio. No matter how good you are, you need other people to look at it. And then when they look at it, they give you this help. They tell you what they see of what you're doing. And a lot of times it'll sting, or you feel like, oh, I don't really want to do that, or whatever. But it gives you another way of looking at your work, and you get better. The number of times you actually make different things, not just the things that you're good at, make as many of the thing that you are interested in at whatever level of craft and finish, but make sure you have an audience that of uh, uh, collaborators who can comment on it credibly for you, and you'll get better. It's the most, it's the easiest university, quote unquote kind of experience of being a creative person that's out there. And it's free. You know why it's free? Because people will tell you anyway, whether you want it or not. <laughs> you know, I like this thing, but I didn't understand that. This part over here kind of sucks. And then as much as you don't want to hear that, you need that. And if you make remake that or do something else, you get better. Free. Right? you get better. The more product you put out there, over the course of like a number of years, you will look back on the work that you did 
the thing that you do now versus the one you did five years ago is markedly better because you kept making stuff and letting people examine it. Go to that uncomfortable edge, that is, and people will dream along with you. Thank you. That was very prolific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yes, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast too. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, yeah it's been you. an honor talking to yeah, you. Yeah, we were really, we were really excited yeah. today. Oh, to talk thank to you, you very much. <laughs> I hope it's it's useful to somebody somewhere down the line. And oh yeah, I'll, our our listeners will hopefully take all this in and apply it to wherever they will. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let's build rocket ships to go to Mars, <laughs> so I can go. <laughs> Looking at you, Elon Musk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, this has been the 33rd episode of Downtime Podcast with Elise and Jeremy featuring Ronnie Del Carmen. Thank you so much again for going on the podcast. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And we'll talk to you all next week. Yep. Later.